uh, happy Halloween and uh, what else? Happy fall, I guess. What's the story on this t-shirt? I got this t-shirt about a year and a half ago when I went to Grinduro. <clears throat> so I have a couple of ideas for a video. How a power meter works, that's one. Then talk about um, the heart rate monitor because I think there's a perception now out in the cycling community that the power meter is the holy grail of cycling training tools. Perhaps a little background into how a power meter works can help you better understand how to use the power meter to get the most out of it. All right, so the first thing we will need to do is define a few terms. First obvious one is power. What is power? So let's define that. Power is work divided by time. Okay. I think this is pretty understandable. Power is the amount of work that you have done in a period of time. And the units for power are watts. W-A-T-T-S. Those are the units of power. Okay, so now that we know that power is equal to the amount of work we've done in a period of time, what is work? How do we define work? Work is equal to, is the amount of force that you've applied times the distance to which that force was applied. So if we look at this, the units for work are force times the distance, and that is equal to Newton's times meters. All right, so now we know what work is. But what is a Newton? Um, and who was Newton? So I'll give you a quick background. Newton was a physicist, probably one of the most monumental physicists of all time. Um, and he built upon the starting work of Galileo. So Galileo, he was a philosopher, astronomer, mathematician. He began to study the motion of particles. And that is often called kinematics. N Galileo, interestingly enough, died in the year 1642. And in 1642, another man was born by the name of Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton is the one who basically carried on from where Galileo left off and developed all of the equations for motion. So, Gal uh, Newton, not, not a fig Newton, but a Newton is the unit of force. So when you push on something, that you are exerting a force on that object. In the SI system, the units for that force is a Newton. The force must be proportional to the object's mass times its acceleration. So now we know what a force, we now we know what force is. Force is the mass times the acceleration we know that work is force times the distance, and we know that power is work divided by time. Okay, so I guess that's it. That's how our power meter works. All right, guys. Um, thanks for watching. No, no, there's much more to the story. We need to know how does a power meter collect the data? So I'm gonna need to clear some room here. Um, and I am going to leave this at the top. So what we have is we have a saddle and a seat post. 
with a 73 degree angle. We have a head tube, we have a down tube, we have a chain stay, a seat stay, we have a fork with a nice big curve on it, we have our stem and our drop bars, we're going to have a rear wheel, we're going to have a front wheel, whoops, that is, we're going to have some spokes, okay, so anyway, we have a crank, we have a, a chain ring, we have our pedal, and of course we have a cassette back here with the chain connected to it, and we have our basic bicycle. And our bicycle is riding along on some sort of surface, and our rider is applying pressure to the pedals. That pressure is actually a force. The force on the pedals is what makes the rear wheel move, which moves us along on in this direction under some velocity V. Now, to do that, the bike must be overcoming some resistance. Otherwise, the bike would just speed off into infinity without ever slowing down. So what are those resistances? Well, you have wind resistance, you have friction, frictional resistance from the tires, and you have the inertial resistance of the mass of the bike, which is the bike plus the rider, okay? Um, there's obviously more frictional forces here that I'm not accounting for. You've got internal friction with these bearings, internal friction in the chain and the, uh, the hub and all that stuff. So there's lots of frictional forces here. And that's all keeping the bike from going off into infinity. Um, so with that, we know that there is a force being applied here. And we want to measure that force. So how does a power meter actually measure the force on the pedals? OK, not a problem. So let's take a closer look at that. I need to erase this so we know now we know how that part of the bike moving so there's three different there's basically three different power meters you've got a crank based power meter you have a hub based power meter and a um, pedal based power meter they all work on the same principle they basically measure force but I do think the one that's the most easily vi visualized is the crank based power meter so let's take a quick look at that so here is our pretend this is our chain ring and this is our crank arm and we have a pedal on it, and there is a force on this pedal, F, and that's what we want to measure. So when a person stands on this pedal, they apply a force over a distance, over the length of the crank arm, we'll call that L, and the length of the crank arm is a fixed dimension. It does not change, but it does go around in a circle. And we have our chain attached to our crank. And when we push down on this, we create tension in the chain. And that tension is what turns the rear wheel, which moves us forward. OK, so I think that's pretty understandable. So now where does the power meter come in here? So if you look at like an SRM, generally the power meter is, is built into this part of the of the crank. And why I drew it like that is because I don't want you to focus too much on the shape of it because that's not really what matters. What matters is that when you push on here, you're creating a torque on this. You're creating torque on your crank. And when you apply a torque, you get what's called deflection this thing twists a little bit and that twisting is directly proportionate to how much force you put on the pedal so the more pedal pressure you apply the greater the torque the greater the deflection the, the more this thing is going to want to bend a little bit now we're talking you know my, micrometers of displacement so it's a very small amount but it is something and with a sensitive enough equipment, we could actually measure that deflection. And that's exactly 
how a power meter works. It essentially t measures deflection. It measures the stretching of the material as it's being as as a force is being applied to it. So how does that work, you ask? Okay, great. I'm glad you asked. So I'm going to erase the bicycle now because you all know what that looks like. Okay. So to measure the deflection of something, you need to um, understand some, a, a concept called strain. Strain is basically, if you have a material, we'll call it aluminum, and we pull on it with, if I pull on this with a tension, we'll call that T, this material will stretch. It's aluminum, it will stretch a little bit, not much, but it will. So let's say it stretches that much. I pulled on it and it changed from L1 to this delta, we'll call that delta. So when I pull on with T, I get a little deflection. I get that delta. So strain is basically the percentage of that displacement. So that can be expressed as delta over L1. So if you look at this, this is just a, a if you multiplied this by 100, you would get the percent change in length due to this force. Notice that there is no units associated with strain because delta is measured in some unit length and length one is in units of length and those divide out, they cancel each other out. So you have basically a unitless number and that is strain. So strain is basically how much something changed from its real, uh, original shape. So it's sort of the relative change. All right. So now you will know what strain is. The next topic we'll need to cover is how do you measure strain to put it into a digital format. So the way that is done is going back to our little bar. We have a piece of material. We're pulling on it like this. We put on here what's called a little strain gauge. And a strain gauge is basically a resistor. It's an electronic resistor. And when it stretches, the resistance of the strain gauge changes. So it's not a constant. It's, it's relative to how much stretching is going on. So what, what they do, or what the, what's going on inside this special power meter, is what is known as a Wheatstone bridge. A Wheatstone bridge is a circuit of resistors that are wired in such a way so as to be able to measure changes. Okay, so here's a Wheatstone bridge and I have put a voltage source on here and we have some resistors, R1, R2, R3, R4, and call that R5. And I don't actually remember if this is even drawn correctly, but the idea basically is that when you have a, a circuit with a voltage source applied to these various branches of the circuit, the, the, the voltage of each one of these is dependent on the resistor value. Now, if we take this resistor, for example, our strain gauge, and we, we substitute, we'll call it R sub S, we substitute R sub S into this circuit down here. When this changes, the current through this branch, these different branches has to change because the resistor is changing. And if the current's changing, the voltage measured across each one of those has to change also. So um, with that, as long as this thing is able to stretch and change resistance, all we have to do is measure the voltage across our strain gauge to know that it is changing. And what we can do, and what the little computer does, is the strain is calibrated to, the, to a known force. So what we do is we put a strain gauge 